welcome to the first episode of Rams Brawl. This is Derek C. Apollo with my co-host, my partners in crime on this first edition of the show. Former Rams linebacker Tommy Polly and running back Arlen Harris. They kick off our first show and they're going to kick it off with a look at two of the positions. Maybe if we get through it last time we ran this thing through, it didn't quite work out that way. But we're going to check it out today. Arlen, going to start with you, man. How you doing? I'm doing good. Doing good. Getting used to being in the house a little bit more. Spending time with the family, missing football a whole bunch, but uh, can't complain. So you're on lockdown now, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I'm on lockdown. Still uh, teaching part time. We got uh, online classes where I'll be able to Zoom with some of my students, still giving out assignments and uh, interacting with them that way. And, uh, you know, that's pretty much it right now. What do you teach? Sports performance. Sports performance, that is... It, it's a it's a high-level PE, you know, specialized. You know, my kids make fun of me and say, man, it's gym class. I, for me, it's a, it's a, it's, I call it honors sports performance. You know, honors it's a little bit more serious than the typical just go out there and play uh, recess all day. So these are the people who actually maybe want to move on, do something athletically at yeah, the next yeah, level. Yeah, yeah, Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> We're going to ask you more questions about that a little bit later. Okay. Tommy Polly. Yes. Glad that you are a part of the action with us. How are you doing out there in Missouri? Well, I'm holding up. Actually, I'm in Illinois, right across the bridge from uh, St. Louis. But I'm holding up, you know, in quarantine like everybody else. Actually, yesterday, like, oh, I like my first Zoom with one of my players. So we went over, watched a little film, and, and, and got it in the playbook a little bit. So that was interesting. But other than that, just in the house with the family, trying to stay safe. I stay out of the way. That's about it. But I'm happy to be with the broad. It seems like it's a growing network. I'm happy to be a part of it. Well, I guess we're all going to find out how fast it grows real soon because we're going to have nothing else to do except sit at home and listen to podcasts at some point here because we're all just in lockdown. I guess I want to ask you too. I mean, you're coaching. You've been coaching. What else are you doing besides coaching these days? All right, that's about it. I'm just coaching, uh, just giving back to the youth. Uh, that, that's about it. Last year, like I said, I was at a uh, post grad prep for like four or five months, so that, that that took up a lot of my time. Yeah, recruiting all people, things like that. But other than that, nowadays I'm just coaching uh, the new gig. I just got the same high school over in St. Louis. So, folks, this is the format of the show. We have two former Rams on the show right now. We're going to get to know each of them. It's been a while since maybe we talked to them. Arlen's been on my show before, and I haven't had the pleasure of having Tom on my show. But now this is our new show, the Rams Brawl, the first episode in our history here. This is meant to be back and forth. It's meant to, you got an offensive guy, we got a defensive guy. Both have played together, both know each other, and both have some experience behind their belts. And it's my job to facilitate discussion, so to speak. So before we even get into the actual, and there's a lot to discuss, we, uh, we know we have a lot to discuss I want to give you guys more of a background on Arlen and Tommy, and the for the best way to do it would be through a little bit of true and false. So we have four questions for each side here, and the winner here gets first dibs in our first face-to-face matchup. And I'm going to start with Arlen. True or false? You ready? Yes, sir. Okay. Here we go. True or false? Tommy defended... 11 passes in the 2003 season. I'll say true. Sir, that would be false. He defended 12 passes. Oh, man, he's splitting hair. <laughs> it was like five drops. It was like, hey, they wouldn't even, it, man, it was like five or six drops. I should have led the lead that year in the No <laughs> I'm still mad about them. Well, <laughs> pass in the front? I mean, pass in the front? No, man, them five, six drops easy. Okay, here you go. But I, but I get it, though. That's hard. That's a hard one. <laughs> Linebacker with 12 passes. True or false? This is Arlen's now. To you. Arlen had the same offensive coordinator and running back coach in St. Louis and Detroit. True or false? That's to you. True. True. One up for you. Here we go. True or false? Arlen. Tommy was drafted in the second round in his draft year. True or false? True. True. Point. Tommy. True or false? Arlen was the second leading rusher for the Rams out of three years. Two out of three years. True or false? That's true. 
True. Scores 2-1 now. In Tommy's Rams career, he started 57 games. True or false? In his career? His Rams career. His Rams career? See, I'm always getting Tommy the high numbers. Last time I caught me, I'm going to say... I'm going to say false. He, he started more. Watch me be off by like one or two. He started like 60. How many, well, how many games? False. He started oh, He started 49 games. Oh, okay. Well. Okay. So, that gives you two. Here's your third one, Tommy. True or false? Arlen scored three touchdowns in his first NFL start. True or false? That's true. True is correct. All right, here you go, Arlen. You ready? Yeah. Is this the last one? This is this is. I got <laughs> hold on, I got I got to save this. <laughs> we one. tied up right now. Okay. You're tied up. So I'm going oh, well. You, hold on. One, two, three. Make sure you know. I'm, I'm not a math teacher. Nah. One. Uh, we not tied up. It's nah, um, down one. He got he missed. Oh, right, he's missed one. So you know what? I'm gonna go ahead, <laughs> Tommy, and just kind of give um, give you the. I mean, we're going to snake this one here, okay? And we're going to give you the last question because you had a special question for him for true or false. So I'm going to let you let that go last. So this one's worth two. This one's worth two, then. Oh. <laughs> or you, or you wanna, you I'm going to ask Tommy you? first. I'm going to ask Tommy first. Ready? True or false, Arlen returned 1,000 yards every season as a Ram. True or false? Wow. That's correct. So, I, I mean, I guess this could be <laughs> <laughs> Damn, he's killing me. Tommy, no, he here you go. It. He got it. He got it. Well, I, you, buff, man, I can't. I, I let this be, man. I can't help it. <laughs> true, true or false, Arlen? We'll give you the last question. You know, we'll make. You know, I think Tommy would be okay with this. We'll make this. Um, we'll make this worth two points. True or false? You are better than your son at this stage, at the same stage of football. True or false? Uh, who, who, I was better. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I was better. My son. Nah, I give it to my. I give it to eight. my son. Better. Get a little better. Get a little better. Why? Yeah. Why you say that? Shoot, it's number. I, 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 I probably didn't explode to my junior year in high school. Yeah, I he I, right I, out the gate. Yeah, I, I figured that uh, you'd enjoy Tommy throwing a little bit of shade your way for that question. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't no shade right there. That ain't no shade. Bring that man up good, like he, you know, doing. He giving him all the corners. Yeah, hey, man. When he up, see him up on uh, last football season, seeing Arlen talking about his son on social media, it's on Twitter, and seeing the pride in his boy Arlen. That's uh that's quite an accomplishment your son's got going on down there. So, congrats to you guys. Yes, sir. All right, yes, sir. Tommy, tell it's been a long time for the fans since they maybe they've had a chance to catch up with you. So, can you tell? Fans, what you've been doing since you left the game, in ter- the pro game, and uh, moved on with your life. What's been going on? What you been doing? Uh, just basically working with, uh, working with the youth. I work with kids in the juvenile system. I work with kids with hidden disabilities. I help them get them for gain employment. I've been coaching um, at different levels, high school levels. I've been with the prep school the last two years. But basically, since I've been retired, I've just been giving back to the youth. That's something I always wanted to do. When I was coming up in the inner city of Baltimore, a lot of people helped me get to where I got to be at. So I always uh, wanted to pay it forward. So whenever I get a chance to get back to you, to get them words of wisdom, to get them advice, give them some pointers, tips, whatever I can do, that's what I try to do. And that's how I live my life by as a servant leader. And, um, and, and you know, that's, that's what I just basically been doing. Can I come back to you? A couple more questions for you. You mentioned earlier you're teaching. We know you're coaching football. When you were on Rams Talk Radio last year, you gave us a whole bunch of details about where you're going with the running back position. How has that venture been going, and what kind of success are you seeing? Well, I'm seeing a lot of success. You know, I've been <clears throat> just a mentor and, and um, you know, just helping, you know, young kids all the way up through the ranks um, develop their skills as far as at the running back position. And then also coaches, you know, just going over, you know, anything to do with running back, drill-specific stuff, film nutrition, working out, all this stuff that I'm passionate about. And at the same time, you know, building those bridges and connections with somebody, you know, might be like-minded that's in a different area of state, travel all over the country, I've had opportunities to leave the country, I actually did some stuff in Mexico City, Norway, you know, doing camps, combines, you know, being around 
the sport as much as possible and, you know, developing young men and, and, you know, spending some time also with the Arthritis Foundation, being an advocate for them. So just staying busy, being around people. And, and like Tommy said, man, just paying it forward. Awesome. So we basically have our, our three people, myself included, who spend their lives teaching one way or the other, coaching in the classroom, so on and so forth. So this is just going to make for a fascinating podcast. Tommy, I don't mean to ask this question, but I've been curious more than anything. What caused you to choose retirement? What happened that you walked away from the game? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, for me, I was just, it was just a, a matter of frustration. You know, I played the Rams for four years, that I'm and all type of stuff. Then I go to the Ravens and lead them in tackles. And I just felt as though at that time, a 30 year old probably not going to get a big deal. At that time, where football was no hose barred, you go down on kickoff, you got to hit the wedge. It, it wasn't the, the, the risk and reward, just wasn't, wasn't there for me personally. I felt like I earned, I did enough on the field to at least earn a little bit more respect in the earnings department. So, so for me, it was more a risk reward. Do I pay out here for another one year minimum where I'm going to start 16 games? And then they're going to show me the door again. Nah, to me, at that point, I couldn't. The younger, that, that part of me, you know, when, you, when you're when you young and and you got a lot of pride and, and, and you can see the numbers in your face, but it's politics of it, maybe. Um, so for me, that's what made me, you know, it's not, it was time for me to go. I just couldn't see myself being a journeyman. <laughs> Basically so- in the next. You said something really key there, and we're seeing more and more sentiment around the league about this as well. Risk versus reward. We're seeing more and more players walk away from the game 30 years old and younger. How much of that in your mind was not just about the respect factor? How much of it was the possibility of a major injury? Head injuries have become more and more out there in the public eye now. How much of that was also a factor for you saying, you know what, I'm done? Yeah, that jumps to the game. I mean, I'm... I'm playing, like, give you that little check at the end of the year uh, with how many snaps you played, the performance check. I'm running that up. they like, yeah, Tom, you leading the league in the performance check. Yeah, because you got me starting and I'm playing on all the special teams. That, to me, wasn't – that's what I mean by risk-reward. So now I'm playing all the snaps on offense, defense, and running down on kickoff and punt team and all that for, the, for that little bit. And to me, that's what I mean. The risk-reward wasn't – to me, I don't love the NFL that much because, man, that hitting that wedge, <laughs> that's for them young whippersnappers, them <laughs> first, second guys. Not no seven, eight-year vet running down there hitting no the wedge. Nah, that's not going to happen. So, time to go. Arlen, you also, you had a good tenure in the league. You were part of the British show on turf. Both of, you, both of you were. Both of you were members of the greatest show on turf. What was key in you choosing also to move on with your career away from the game and do something else? Well, really for me, I think I hit my peak just my, just physically in college. I've always had the little nagging injuries, overcame some things just to even get into the NFL. I missed my last year and a half prior to I had aspirations to get, you know, drafted and all that stuff. So when I came into the league, I was a priority free agent, but I had to come in through the back window. So my story is a lot different than Tommy's in the sense of for me to stay on the team, I had to do those special team things. The good thing is, you know, I'll be in a returner. You know, those are extra touches for me, you know, which, you know, I, I'm not going to turn that down. That, that was good. That was like getting, you know, a handoff. But, you know, we took pride in that. You know, Bobby April did a good job of making special teams excited. But after two, three years, you know, you start smelling yourself like, hey, man, I'm going to be in this league for a couple of years. I'm vested. But you also got money, guys. You start switching teams. When I went to Detroit, I led I led the team in rushing in preseason. But you ain't a money guy. <laughs> so you start to see the business start to to move a little bit. And, you know, you just got to know your place. You know, I always going to be a team guy. But unfortunately, like I told you, the arthritis thing for me, when it started to peak itself in college each year, it became more and more evident taking those hits, you know, at the professional level. Like Tony said, man, you running down there, you know, on kickoff, 
you know, you turn around, you on kickoff return, you on punt, punt return, you on the sideline waiting, and you got guys like Marshall, Kevin Jones and them, third down, they don't feel like blocking, they throw me in there. I got Zach Thomas coming 100 miles an hour, you know, mm-hmm. so you the bang-up guy, and your body's taking that toll, and, um, you know, for me, I didn't really have that option. You know, when, when I moved on my last year with Atlanta, you know, I was I was excited, looking forward to make make that team and playing the Ravens. I just got I got knocked out of that game, got a serious injury, so it wasn't so much a, a decision on me. It, it was it was more the decision was made for me. <clears throat> so I have to ask both of you: Did you two ever face each other in drills? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm Let sure me- we have, but yeah, we'll go ahead. So how'd that let go? Let me tell you about this. So let me tell you about this. Cause I, I see some people have pride, man. I know what I was blessed. I know what I was capable of and, and, and how my, how my career went. So again, you know, Tommy, I know for Florida state all everything, second round pick. And you know, Tommy ain't the typical LB. When you look at him, he's long athletic. And that's such an advantage where you want that dude. That's going to come right down the middle. You know where he's going to be at. So I remember multiple times going one on ones and pass protection because most backs, you know, they don't want, they don't, I don't care who they, nobody wants to do one on ones pass protection because really that's the defensive advantage they got the whole field to work with. So to the point, man, TP was just so smooth with his rushes, make you feel like you blocking air. He give you a little hand over hand, push you by the side, and you you sitting in your little strike position, ready to pop him in his chest. And that's what I always stick out to me because we had peace. We had a lot of good linebackers. But with Tommy, I'm thinking, oh, this dude a big target. He ain't going to be able to come down. In my, I'm going to get lower. He don't want to come down to my world. And he was able to just manipulate space, man. Like, it was nothing, no matter how big, tall, short you were. And that just was always impressive to me. So, we definitely would mix it up. Well, how about that? So, <laughs> I was well, I was trying to see if there would be some trash talk in there and bring back some memories and – you go the respect route. Okay. Okay. So I guess I'll turn that back to you, Thomas. I think my nemesis with the Rams is Marshall. You know, me and Marshall always stayed at it. I mean, we talk trash from the practice field, all on the bus. I mean, all day. That's all we did. So, I mean, all of us, you know, all of the laid back guy. I'm really a laid back guy. But me and Marshall, I don't know, we just always had this thing with each other. Yeah. So, what do you remember about Arlen on the field? Well, Harlan was a nice back. To me, you know, at that time, he was a third down back. So that's the only time he's saying, like you said, he coming on third down. Harlan, was, he was one of them little shorter backs. So them were the ones that, you know, kind of give you a problem because you had to, like you said, get down to that level to try to hit him. But, you know, he was, he, he was a tough he was a tough kid. But when you got Marshall out there, you know, it's like anything, less, you know, anything underneath that, that's what you try, that's what you try to look for. So no disrespect. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go to both you guys here because you were both part of the greatest show on turf. Unfortunately, you started seeing the end of it. What is your best memory about the greatest show on turf? I'm going to go to Arlen first for that. What was your best memory about playing with that unit? Truthfully, I don't think I even deserve to really say that because my rookie year is 03. So I caught the back end. A lot of those guys were still there. I mean, as much as I would love to say, man, I was a part of that. I don't want to disrespect those guys that was part of that. Super Bowl run. A lot of them guys were still in that locker room, but like Oz was gone, Pro, the nucleus was there. But I think that's more of a question for Tommy. You know what I'm saying? But there was still some of that presence that presence was in there from that team. But like Mike Marsh for me, that's my head coach. <laughs> I had him for five years in a row. So some of those guys got this they would call him Mike. They knew him as a coordinator. So I didn't have that relationship with him. So I, I don't think that's fair for me to really. I can't speak on those years. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. If that's if that answers your question, that's, I, that's I, I fair. Think TP's better. Well, Tommy, your thoughts on playing the back end of that that run? In the back end, we went to the tip. I was there. I think the year before I got there, they lost. Uh, I think in the playoffs to the mm-hmm. Chiefs, maybe. So it was like dead back in the middle. I would say it was like, but I, I know I got mixed emotions uh, when they drafted me. Like we went. My first year, it, was, it seemed great. You know, it was 14-2, went to the Super Bowl. I think I thought we should have won it. If we would have probably ran Marshall a little more. We got away from the run game. And um, can't do that against New England. They're going to make you play honest. 
But then after that, I think when Kirk got his little injury, this sec- my second year, Tommy he wasn't throwing the ball right. I remember t- sitting in training camp like, man, something wrong with Kirk. Oh, man, he's throwing ducks out there, man. This ain't right. Like, ah, that don't look right. So, uh, and, and, and that was the beginning of it. For the most part, Kirk injury kind of opened up the other stuff that was going on upstairs behind the scenes as far as uh, Mike Postmart and, and Jay Zygma and the Tata Arm, Army and all that, whatever was going on with that. But on the field, I think when Kurt Hand got messed up or whatever it was that made him throw the ball not as strong anymore, that's when the drama came. But for the most part, the players, they was, uh, it was a good team uh, when I got there. It was professional uh, with Aeneas Williams, mm-hmm. Isaac Bruce, Tony Hope. Those guys are very professional. Orlando Pace, I mean, those guys work out fanatics. They practice hard. They worked out hard. They were studious guys. They knew their playbook. And they was humble. Uh that was the main thing. You wouldn't even know they probably played in the league. They was really good guys. So, I mean, I kind of looked up to them anyway because I always, I, I knew who they was anyway, the type of great players they were. And they always held you to a standard uh, of, of, of excellence, of, 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 of always being prepared uh, uh, when it's time to go. So when you come to camp, tell them you better be ready. Be, be already in shape. Don't come here until I get in shape. So they was already on that because we practiced fast. We had to run to the ball on defense, and then Mike Moss did everything, speed, shift, and everything was real fast. So that's why I remember just a lot of motion and shifting and professional uh, of the players and, and how fast everything was moving. I know when I first got there, I mean, he was moving fast. So. But then uh, injuries took over, like I said, uh, with uh, McCurt, and it kind of went, it kind of went bad that year. Then a uh, came in, he stayed the ship for a couple years, and and after that, I don't think they was really trying to win anymore. I mean, truth be told. One question for for you guys, and then we're going to actually get on to the other part of the show here, about that team. I talked with Mark Bolger in the past, and in conversation with him, he was an ardent defender of Mike Martz. I believe he's one of the smartest football minds in the last 50 years. And he had a way of rubbing front offices the wrong way, and that's why he never was able to stick it out as a head coach or so on and so forth. Would you ag- agree or disagree with that assessment of Mike Mars that he was a great football mind that he and but also he ticked people off? Yeah, I think a Dick Vermeil would have stayed the head coach. I think the the the, the streak would have went longer. Dick Vermeil was more of a people's person. Mike Mars was more to me of an offensive coordinator. Like you said, offensive mind. But when you're the head man, you got to uh, get along with the bottom man on the roster the same way you deal with the top man as, as much as you can. I mean, I think he thought it was more about all about his offensive plays and about his offensive system and not about the actual people. To me personally, he didn't get along with the, the people, the players. And and I guess, uh, and uh, with Baldi said also with the front office, so I, said, I guess it was a combination of of the, of the two. So he, he just wasn't a good people person at, at, at the end of the day. And I mean, as a coach, I mean, that's what I try to be. I mean, some, some days these kids drive me crazy. At the end of the day, I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to talk it out and, and we, we're going to get through it. I'm not just going to throw you away and, and forget about you type of, type of person. So, I, I mean, that's why I see. So I, I, I what I could say, I could see some truth in what to saying how he, his personality ticked people off. Arrogant a little bit. Arlen? Your thoughts? I, I mean, at the, the time that I've seen him in, in two different cities, I, I just think, he, you know, he wants something a certain way, and that's Mike. You know, he ain't going to apologize for it. And, he, I, you know, again, I don't I, – I don't, I can't profess to know how he moves up in those offices. I, again, that, he's always been my coordinator. I've only seen him at that front, so I can't speak on some of those other relationships. But you see different things. You, you One day, if you might, you know – Coach Mars guy, I was blessed for a time there. To like, I was one of his guys. Like, you know, they they contacted me to come out to Detroit. I knew his offense. He knew what he was going to get out of me. You know what I mean? He knew who I was going to help and, and push and all that stuff. But at the same time, you know, you have one day, he talked to you. That next day, he walked right by you. And you like, yo. <laughs> like, so that, that was, you know what I mean? So it's, it's just, you know what I mean? You learn to, you know, you learn to deal with those things. How did you view him as a football mind? Oh, he a uh, genius. I yeah, mean, he too. And that's the thing, too, man. I, and I think more of I try to be, you know, 
you know, you played at a high level. Okay, great. But for me, I try to be even a better coach because like, like TP can give him credit to Marshall. Marshall was another coach in the field. Like Marshall's mind to me could be, he was right there with Mike being underneath of him and then the offense that he's played in. So to learn from these guys and separate and really see how they view the game of football. I mean, Mike will have conversations with Kurt, Mark. He's sitting there with Coach Hannafin talking to the linemen. He's making adjustments. And I'm sitting there looking at this dude like, what, like, what, like, what is this? And then Coach Marks, you know, and you just see how they would just start breaking things down. And week by, week by week, even though we got the same plays, it's a totally different game plan. The approach would might be the same, but just how they, again, the professionalism and, like, we don't make mistakes. We Mike Marks was a walk-through kid. We walked through maybe four times before we even go to a meeting. We go to a meeting. We're going to walk through another game again. We're going to go practice, and if you don't like it, we're going to walk. Like, we then we – like, defense will be looking, eating, and we out there walking through. Like, that's – so when we hit the field, if you make a mistake, you ain't playing because – we didn't walk through it. We didn't watch it. We didn't did everything. And that was the thing about Mike. His his expectations was so high, and he prepared you at such a level that there was no excuses come game day. So, well, there it, you go. It was pretty impressive. So, yeah, I've I've heard a lot about his football mind and just the kind of like lack the people skills, I guess. All right, so there you go, folks. There's our introductions to both Arlen Harris and Ty Paul. Reintroductions for many of you. And just for me, you guys know me, if you listen to Rams Talk Radio, I've been hosting and running Rams Talk now for, uh, geez, I've been running, running Rams Talk for seven years and and hosting the podcast there, Rams Talk Radio for four. This is me coming over to do Rams Brawl as well and hopefully have some great football conversations with, some, with two good guys here. Moving forward, let's talk some current Rams football, maybe even some NFL. If we pay on time today. The Rams do have needs, guys, and I'm going to go over to Arlen first because Arlen, we're zero in the running back position. What did the Rams lose when Todd Gurley was released? I mean, we know what he was a year or two years ago. What do they lose now based on what you saw last season, and what do they need to do to address that running back position? Well, they lost a leader. They lost, even though... The past two years, they saw some decline in Gurley's performance. That's still production. Um, And they lost, you know, a a, a face guy. I mean, even though you see some of that stuff at defenses, you still have to account for him. You know what I mean? It's just like, you know, when people are dinked up, defenses still, you don't know. Just that one play, you might ease up. He might, you know, be able to have break one on you. But I think all in all, um, I mean, shoot, just two years ago, he's the highest paid guy. You saw he was able to do. There's a lot of question marks after the playoffs. You know, still question marks about his health. He's moved on right away, not just filling that spot, but you have to fill that spot with the caliber running back of a Todd Gurley. You just can't get a guy. Now, I know they got Henderson from Memphis. He, you know, was kind of underutilized. You know, people are saying, hey, did he learn the playbook? Is he too small? You know, does he need a couple more year, years underneath of his belt? Again, I laugh, and I'm not in a situation like him, but I think about when he brought in Steven Jackson, and you sit here and you're like, yo, you know, and how he was able to push a Marshall or just anybody. That's just kind of how it is in that backfield. They need to go out and get a guy. And I don't know if they're going to do them, They're going to be able to do that free agency. They got to draft a stud. And th- I think there are capable backs in the draft coming out. And it got to be a back that's going to be effective in the, in the passing game. You need to have a back, you know, if he's not going to be running those deep routes, maybe coming out the backfield, you need to have a good, a real strong uh, screen game or somebody that can be effective to be involved in that spread and that hurry up offense. So I think they got their work cut out for him, but I don't think they would have let him go, go without something in mind. I, um, clearly, I think that's going to be one of the highlighted spots they need to um, address this year. Going to come back to who in a minute, who you have in mind, who you think would be a good fit for them draft wise. Tommy, from a defensive point of view, what does losing Todd Gurley do to the Rams offense? Uh, what does it do for the offense? Well, they don't have a, a, a threat. Like from the defense, I'm looking at their looking at their offense. 
I don't see any receivers that's top of the line. I don't see any running backs that's top of the line. I mean, Michael Brown, Michael Brown had some moments. The tight end played well at the end of the season. I, um, I think he'll be okay, but, I mean, the receivers, I mean, all, you know, all those guys are just, I mean, Jack, I mean, they just some guys. So, I mean, until you upgrade that department at least, and like you said, get a back that, I mean, because, you know, the, you want to run the ball first, and then and then so deep, and that's what he's trying to do. So, I mean, they have some things, some needs that they, I think they, they need offensive players, me personally. They need more offensive players. So, you, when we've talked a little before, you mentioned the receivers. I'm not, we're not going to forget about that because I want to, you mean, you don't believe the Rams receiving core is what the fan base believes it is. And that plays a role as well. I want to get back to that. Let's hold that thought. Because, I, I mean, we're talking about running backs today, but the receivers in the Rams offense pl- matter. The, this is a, a run base, a run first offense that is supposed to make the pass offense better. Arlen, who have you seen coming up draft wise that fits with the Rams need? Well, like I said, they, they got a lot of top backs coming out in this draft. Um, there's obvious choices, but to me, I think Swift. I, I don't think there's no way in the world they're going to get to him. Kid out of Georgia, Philly boy. I, I mean, he's the best back clearly in this draft. I think he can get it done on the ground and in the air. Is he going to run those, you know, post routes coming out the back backfield? Uh, but I think you know, doing being effective in the screen game and and. Um, keeping some of those linebackers in a box, without a doubt, he can make that um, happen. And then that Cam Akers kid, another Florida State boy. I know Tommy like that. I think the speed yeah. of him and being able to utilize him in space. I know people question his vision. I think he's just more of a, you know, a jitter guy, and he wants to see it and, and, and get back. He cut back things a little bit too much, but um, I think in, a, in in this offense with all the zone blocking, it'll, it'll kind of play into what. He does. Whether they can get to him, I don't know. Um, he's another one because I know his, after the combine, his st- uh, status has, has come up. But I mean, there's other guys, your, your Dobbins, Taylor, Dylan, the kid Clyde from LSU. I don't, those are good backs, but I don't think they're going to fit in what McVay's trying to do. Because even though we're talking about, okay, we got another a lot of two and threes in, in this Rams offense they're still going to need to get a stud receiver as well. So how they can pull this off next year, getting a name guy at back and a name guy at receiver, that's what's going to be um, difficult. So um, even though there's a lot of backs, you know, the, long, the long short of it, Swift and Akers, I mean, those if they can find a way to get those guys, move up, move whatever, pay Peter, Rob Peter to pay Paul to get those guys, that'd be great. There's a couple other guys in there, but they, they, need, a, they need a dude. You know what I mean? They they need a name guy. You don't believe Dobbins is a fit for them? I think Dobbins is a downhill, old school, Big Ten. Like, the Rams is a no huddle, let's let's go. Like, we need to go. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying he can't do it. But, I mean, I think he's going to be getting, he's going to have to get his win. And he's going to have to get pulled in and out of there. He's not going to be able to stay in there at third down. He's going to be gassed if they're going to really use him. because. They're no huddle. They do a lot of that motion. And if he gets two outside zone plays and they screen him, oh, he, they have to pull him out. <laughs> He's done. It seems that the Rams are moving more towards a two-back system, getting away from the whole f- feature system. Tommy, could that work for them as a defensive guy? And can the Rams make a two-back system work and, and cause defensive problems? Well, that's the whole, uh, comp- I mean, the whole division now. Seattle, what they run a two back with a tight end, twenty one personnel, twelve personnel, and um, San Francisco, they come out there twenty two personnel, twenty three. I mean, they 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 come out there for real old school. So it's going along with that that division, hard nose. Uh, we going to run right at you, and um, we don't need our quarterback to really do much. Just to make some plays here, there. We're going to play offense, defense, special teams. All three of those teams. I mean, that's a tough division. Then you got. Uh, the pass happy probably uh, Arizona uh, with Kenya Drake more of a third down back more of a receiving threat but they got three receiver two receivers as bona fide Hall of Famers so them going to two back I can see it playing into with the whole division is going there. All right, so I didn't want to. I'm going to. I want to put a, a pause here for now. So you guys are looking at running back definitely 
get one early in the draft, that's where you think they're going. There are a couple other things with the Rams that we need to get to, and we're running out of time for this show today, and so I want to make sure that we address them. We'll get to linebackers next time, and we're going to get to receivers because you guys have kind of just dabbled a little bit in terms of what you think about the Rams receiving core. But there are other things that went on recently with the Rams that we got to get your take on because you're you're Rams. You've worn the horns. First things first, the logo, the one that's causing the fuss. The uh, the Rams released their new logos recently. The the fans uh, reacted very negatively, especially to the L.A. with the horn. Not not as much the Ram head. The Ram head kind of got eh. All right. You guys are players, though. You you obviously are going to see things differently. Tommy, I'm going to go to you first now. What do you think of that logo change? I mean, you wore the horns. It's a uniform that, in the past, anyways, has been tradition. You wore a different color when you were there, but you still wore the horns. What do you think? It, to me, I, you know, you know, I love the horns. Um, you know, I, you know, I especially love the throwback uniforms, the ones they wore in the '80s, Barry Dickinson and all. I love those. Fortunately, unfortunately, I never got a chance to wear them. Uh, Mike did never, he never liked the way to go back to the phone. Anyway, he did, he, you know, Eric Dixon, he's a spokesman for the people. I mean, he, he, he didn't say it. I mean, he didn't put it out. He don't like it. Uh, the fans, you know, they didn't say it. they don't like it. And with, with the dude came out there and said, well, he don't care anyway. And he liked it. So, I mean, that's what they, you know, they, I think they doing it more of a, like I said, a branding thing, uh, more of, you know, people got to buy more merch. And stuff like that, and you know, as, you know, as you open up the new stadium and things like that. So I think it was, you know, it's more of a, 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 a branding play more than any more than anything. But I mean, you gotta listen to your your customers. Your customers don't like it. I mean, you should you might should have asked them before you probably did it, and then you know made your decision. You know, the worst part about that is they did ask the fans. The fans gave their opinions. Elite that, and they got the colors right. The rest, though, yeah, that, just uh, you know, they don't have the Rams. That little thing they said with the wave is supposed to be the sun, and the wave of, and it's supposed to represent Southern California. But uh, obviously, they, Southern California, I don't think so. It was interesting. Arlen, your thoughts? I'm I'm impartial, man. I, I like the other logos better. Obviously, it is what it is. You know, it's done. He's not changing it. Those guys is getting paid to wear that. I mean. There's not much they can do. And even though those fans, they might be disgruntled, but once the season kick up, trust me, that, that, that paraphernalia going to fly off the shelves. You think so? Yeah, once they get going. I mean, that's just like anything else. That, I mean, now, if they're not if they're not winning, it might be a little bit slower. But <laughs> eventually, people, when that stadium opens up, people will be excited. But you don't want people to have it and say, I got it, you don't. The, the, the logo ain't horrible. I will say it's not horrible. Right. The better of all of them know. But eventually, I think I think it'll be a uh, like right now. That's it's nothing to talk about. We're gonna talk about that logo. But once they start flying around the football field, you know, it's just like changing the Steelers logo. You gonna change the Steelers logo? <laughs> right. <laughs> Come on. I I think all bets are off if they mess with the actual horns and the helmet. I think I think I think it actually manages the uniform you wear. Like they could change that logo. And go out there in the, in the old yellow and, and royal blue, and people will be happy with it if, if it's modernized, but it still resembles that throwback to it. If they monkey up that uniform, if they mess the horns in the helmet. Like if they did some kind of weird oh, things to do it. That. Oh, yeah. yeah. They Come on that. now. If they, they do that, that's they gonna, blue thing on the helmet. They're gonna look like the XFL or something out there. That's gonna look good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that, that's that's where I think you you'll I I agree actually, Arlen. I think come season starts, I know I will not buy the LA logo. I think it's awful. I will buy the Rams head. It looks like the Chargers, look like the Chargers logo. To be yeah. honest, I mean right. that's yeah. to me the worst part about you. This that's now your your local competition. Even though many Rams fans tell you they're not competition to me, you're, you're still somebody you want to outmarket. You want to outmarket for fifty years to come. So you want to have the coolest, most attractive L.A. Rams kind of logo, not some kind of something that can be confused for something else. They get the colors right, you can't get the thing right. My view, anyway. And they have the easy, like, you going back to L.A., just go back L.A., like, we all in. Just keep everything, you know, they loved it, we're L.A. You don't need to say, 
Leave the St. Louis behind. Cut it off. We all LA. You don't need to go back to LA and reinvent yourself. They had it. They, it was, that's easy. Uh, what do we know? There's a lot of people going to pay a lot of money to come up with that logo. I got into a little debate with Kevin Demoff on Twitter a few weeks back. And I made that point you just made clear. Listen, you ha- you're sitting on a gold mine, the royal blue, yellow uniform. That's a gold mine. That's a legacy uniform. His response was along the lines of, you could say that if you were the Steelers or a team that hadn't changed your colors over the years. And my response to that is, you guys are the ones who changed the colors. You guys were. You had, And every time you pull the throwback out back, people want it. Tommy, you mentioned it. You wish you could have worn that uniform. I wanted to. I was man. I was mad all four years. I was here. I, <laughs> I mean, that uniform to me is like this uniform. And you guys, when you're talking about just hearing you just briefly talk about, it, you, could, you could see and how you describe it. So, my my bet is, is you'll see a fan revolt if they monkey those uniforms too much. That's my bet. If they if those uniforms are modernized, but you keep the horns where they should be, and you didn't do anything stupid to them, you're, you're fine. Uh, one more thing from before we go, and that is the CBA. It, the CBA was recently changed here. What, what people do know is you guys got, well, the league moves to 17 games next year, moves to 14 teams in the playoffs, which in the end we're going to see a bump in the salary cap. But something that's not talked about is the – effects on retired players. And I guess we're going to close with this. I want to hear your thoughts. I'm going to go with Tommy first. Tommy, what are your thoughts on the changes to the new collective bargaining agreement, especially in how it affects you as a former player? Uh, well, it doesn't affect me too much uh, as far as um, total impairment. Because I'm not currently getting any uh, benefits from the league. Apparently, anyway. I mean, I have some other investments in them, but, but not uh disability stuff. So to me, it, it helped out some of them guys in you know the pre ninety three years where I see they got a lot of a, a big bump. Um a couple of them them guys going for like a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars a month. So now they are getting thousand, eleven hundred dollars, something like that. They got a big bump. So um I guess in like in any deal you're gonna have some some winners and some some losers. So uh, that's how I look at it, you know, it's me and there's the versus billionaires, and a lot of times the billionaires going to win. And I mean, from from the time I've been in the league, they done got the better deal every time. And, and, and it's because it's a different league. Like in the, in the, in the NBA, the players in the union, the uh, the league, and the players, they're like they need each other. The league don't look at them like you know you you know you're expendable. Um, so they have a great relationship. So that's why you can they, they get the great deal. But the NFL, like. McNair, the late McNair for the Houston Texans said, you don't let the, the prisoners run their asylum, whatever. Okay, that's how they kind of do it, like the help. You know, the league is three and a half years, so, I mean, you in and out, it's a revolving door. Somebody always going to fill that seat. So, the players on the NFL are never going to get a, a good deal. The, the, the middle of the road players are never going to sit out and miss some checks and miss a year. They might be out of the year. They might be out of the league the next year. They don't know. So, it, I look at all sides. Uh, so, some winners, some losers. Um, and that's just how it's going to be. <laughs> Arlen, you mentioned when we were having a conversation a few days ago that this does affect you. How did it affect you, if you don't mind, if you don't mind saying? So, shout out first to uh, Eric Reed and a lot of the uh, current players that did stand up or people that voted. The funny thing is, it's pretty, it's actually black and white, and the NFL made it. They played on that gray area. First, to take a step back, what Tommy said, like right now, without going to all this stuff, it's pretty it's pretty obvious. First, the main thing that jumps off to a, a, a current player right now is, like you said, tomorrow's not promised, the next year's not promised. If my minimum goes up 100, 150000 plus, that's a no-brainer to a lot of guys. And, it, and they look at, I could just play one more game, and then my practices aren't as violent and I don't have to worry about the pads. Like that's a no brainer for a lot of people. They don't understand it. Not everybody's making millions of dollars in this game. So if you take a, a minimum guy or a special team or what, and you, I can make another, I can make 150,000 play one more game. And then, Oh yeah, by the way, I can smoke marijuana. 
what are we talking about? <laughs> like, that's a no-brainer. And that's not going to be popular for people to hear because that's a media's not attacking that. So the current players, everybody's focusing on that and, and then how it's going to um, affect, you know, the cap and all that stuff. Well, now you got a lot of people um, that aren't playing anymore, the former players. And like TP said, from 93, but even just five, 10 years ago, like myself, I am on disability TNP because of arthritis and other stuff. And how that works is, and it took me, I got denied twice. I got it my third time. And you basically got to go to these doctors and you, and they poke and pry you for three months. And basically you got to prove it, all your um, injuries and say, okay, are these injuries predicated on X and affecting your way of living in some type of way? You know what I mean? And I'm not going to go on all those, all those details for my individual situation, but everyone has different levels and, it's, and it goes off a of percentage. So, okay. So what they did was to make that, to close that gap, they, if you're getting disability from the NFL and then you can also receive social security, the NFL got smart and said, you know what? A lot more people are actually trying to get this and are receiving it. So let's cut off their benefits and use this money to pay these current guys. So paid, I know T, I, I paid fully into everything that you possibly c- could every year that I played. So for somebody to come in in your contract, I played in Social Security, 401k, all that stuff. And for them to vote and say, you know what, never mind, we're going to take that from you. That's my money. They take that from you and say, oh, yeah, by the way, we're going to cut this off from you now with no explanation. That's why so many people are up in arms. Now, there's some people and you'll see on blog sites, there's different um, chats and every bringing sight to it. There's lawyers and all types of things because there's people that are going bunk, bankrupt off of it. There's people that are like, oh, now I can't take care of my husband. There's insurance issues because they can't afford their. I mean, that, the needle that I take once a week is three hundred dollars a needle. You know what I mean? So there's when you start looking at those things, everybody assume, well, well, you got paid. You should save your money. Well, this stuff ain't cheap, and I'm on the back end. Mm-hmm. I can get out of bed every morning. There's guys that can't that are really in bad position. So there's inactive A and active B. And the thing, if you look in the thing that I sent you guys, Eric Reed, where he caught the verbiage that I think is the NFLPA is, and I talked to five guys that I know personally that are currently in NFL that was down in Miami and voted, and I all talked to them prior to voting, and none of them saw what I was talking about after they voted. They went back in in the NFL PA and the, and the verbiage was put on there with the disability. It wasn't even on there. It's totally different. So how can you vote on something you don't see? And it was basically, it's, it was basically take it or leave it. It was all linked in together. So it wasn't like, you know what? Nah, we're not going to take this because of disability. So if I'm a current player and I'm just, I'm being honest and I'm in the situation, I'm thinking I'm playing forever. Or it's still not a guarantee I'm gonna get the T and P or the or the disability. So you want me to take you want me to just turn away 150 plus off of these guys that I don't even know, off of their disability, and I can smoke as much weed as I want to. To me, it was cut and dry from the beginning when I saw it, but they cut themselves and the, they cut themselves in their own foot, shot themselves in the foot when they weren't up front and they took that verbiage out. So that's why so many people are up in arms, those former players. So there's an inactive A and there's an inactive B. So they basically all the money we paid in the Social Security when we played, they took it from they they just took it. Not like by percentage and joined down, they just took it. So for some people, that changed their whole lifestyle. So that's what it is in, in, in base pretty much in a nutshell. So let me get this right. You had an agreement when on your contract, your your union contract. You're going to pay such amount of money in, and you need the benefit. It's there. And now the new contract, they basically, even though you've already paid the money in, you now have less benefits. You're losing it. That exact vote wasn't even put in, in front of the players. And when, and when they saw it was coming down, they didn't put it in there, and it was, there was no – it was dishonest. And even now they keep changing it. So now they're like, well, we'll credit you guys another season. Well, the way this works is if you get total impairment and Social Security, you can't receive your pension anyway. You get penalized. 
So even when I get, let's say I get 65, I wanted to get my pension, whatever that is. If I'm already receiving X, I can't, you don't get both. So there's a lot of little gameplay where they're kind of covering themselves. It's like, all right, we'll give it to you. But there's some guys that aren't getting social security where it's no harm, no foul. They, their money doesn't change, but there's guys that I know that are getting all of it. They're getting total impairment and they're getting disability. Well, they're taking the disability away. And for some people, that's up to 35, 40,000 a year. Now, some people like, you know, the, the bigger guys are like, man, that's nothing. Well, if you look at some of these other people, they're like, that's a game changer, Let, especially what's going on in the world right now. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you think about that. That's another twenty five hundred to three thousand dollars a month that's being taken away. You don't know if people are like, yo, that's my mortgage. And now that's just been taken away from me. And that's effective January 1st of um, this coming year. So. There's a lot of things I'm getting all types of emails where, you know, they're trying to sue and they're trying to get a revote and all that stuff. But before it becomes in, but the next time they got to revote, what's it? 11 years, TP? Like this is, this goes for a whole nine, nother 11 years. 2030, right? Nine, nine, nine. I think at nine, maybe they can go back and start, you know, like they did with this one. Start negotiating. So, so it looks like a lawsuit waiting to happen though, but. I'm not so sure it'd be a lawsuit with the NFL as a lawsuit with the rest of the NFLPA the way you're describing it. No, it's lawsuits all over the place, man. Because it's 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 sad. And again, you, I see horror stories, and I mean, there's guys that again that are that are livelihoods they're jacked up off of this game, and they need that money. That's why it's there. that that's why the NFL got it. That's what it's there for. But then to turn around and say, you know, just pull the you know just pull the covers off of you, it's kind of tough. With all that in mind, folks, we're going to stop there. We have a lot more to talk about. But this, this episode could easily go another an hour. Uh, we want to talk about the receivers. We want to talk about linebackers. And I judge it on what Arlen's saying is you better pay attention to the news because once other things in the world calm down and the NFL comes back to the forefront, I get the feeling that the CBA is going to come back again. It's not the finished business that the public thinks it is right now. So we'll leave it there. Tommy, any last closing thoughts before we get out of here? No, but they got to do something uh, pretty fast because, you know, the year changing and with the draft coming up, they got to get the, the rookies on there. So they need this CBA to go through. So um, it's going to be interesting about how long uh, this whole situation is going is, is going to take. Hey, Arlen, did they talk about when is, is the CBA certified? I mean, is it the new CBA certified? Well, they came back with the, so the whole thing with Eric Reed because they didn't respond to him directly. They responded to the lawyer. And they came back and was saying that they had the right to not put that verbiage in there because they spoke to some other players, all stuff. So it's going to keep going. Again, I don't, you know, try to be, you know, optimistic about the whole thing for some of the other guys. It's like you said, you know, Derek, keep an eye on it. I, like you said, the powers that be, I don't know if it's that far gone already, but with the draft coming up and all that, I, I see it hard for them to be able to go back and revoke. Anytime soon, man, with everything going on right now. Labor, I guess, will, is even the big leagues. Something we got to keep an eye on. All right, folks, it is time for us at the road. I hope you've enjoyed this first episode. I hope you've enjoyed getting to know both Arlen and Tommy all over again through all these years and talking some running back, talking a little bit of receiver, talking CBA, learning a little more about the game and the logo. We got a lot in in an hour, believe it or not. And so we'll be back next week. We're going to talk. Everything we missed this week and more, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Rams Brawl. You can follow us all over social media. Just find Rams Brawl, okay? You can find Tommy on Twitter at tpolly29. You can find Arlen at ArlenHarris33. You can find me at DC Paula. Look for us wherever you find podcasts. We're, we're going to be all over here as part of the Brawl Network. So until next time, for all three of us here at Rams Brawl, have a great one, and we are out of here. Take it easy.